Well, thank you very much, Lisa, for the, the warm welcome and the, and the explanation of the talk. Uh, I had the privilege of, and I understand David McCullough has been at this library. Anyone see David when he was here? I mean, American history man, right? A, a legend. I was fortunate enough to have dinner with him in, in Boston. And uh, he told me, you know, when I speak, I don't even know what I'm going to say. I thought, you are a god. <laughs> I'm not there yet in my career, but I do like the idea of keeping this open. I do like the idea of keeping this energetic, and, and the conversation is what really makes, I think, this a magical time. Uh, and I have to say, as I progress through my career, too, I, it, I can't thank my sponsors enough. And tonight it's the Linda Hall Library, so that's an easy one. Uh, but I understood today, I went to the book vault with Benjamin today, and uh, he showed me some of Galileo's books, first edition he pointed out, <laughs> first edition books, I, I, and I was struck. And he said, you know, well, Galileo, when he was looking through that telescope and, and looking at Jupiter, right? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I turned to my PhD astrologist over here. He, when he noticed the moons, he named them after the Medici family. I thought, that's brilliant. I mean, that man knows where his sponsorship is. <laughs> so thank you, Linda Hall Library. Thank you all for coming here. And uh, writing a book can be a, a torturous process. I never understood that until I embarked on writing my first book. And six books later, I can tell you this is the only reason I keep doing it. It's this exciting connection and sharing, this exchange of information that makes it so, so worthwhile. Uh, we are at the end of the presentation there. So. <laughs> <laughs> we did not start out with high-speed trains. But to give you an idea of what I'm, what I'm going to walk through is, and I, I'm working on a high-speed rail project, it, and it's exciting to think that we might land up there uh, soon one day. But I, I want to walk you through a little bit about who I am, because I think you would want to know your source, but how it relates to the subject matter. This is, this is all about the interstate. This is all about the, the innovation, the technology, and I'm trying to make this, like the exhibits, like gas, food, and lodging. I mean, I love a library that will name the Route 66 exhibit that, but it's also like the other exhibit. This presentation is going to dive into some of the technical parts of it, and I want to move through it quickly. I think Lisa was very worried when she saw 91 images on my PowerPoint pack here, <laughs> but I will move quickly, and I would love to leave time for questions and answers so we have some dialogue, because I'd like to know what's on your minds and what you'd like to know more about that I might not have hit on. Well, why a 1949 Hudson? Uh, I, I started writing books back in 2000, and when I wrote my first book, it was, the, it was the big dig. And then through writing the book and researching the book, I learned from a little pamphlet that our project was really the end of a much larger project. The U.S. interstate system was the largest project when it was launched when? 1956, June 29th, from Walter Reed Hospital, Eisenhower signs the legislation, changes America. But the, the interstate system began in 56, and it ended the last dollar, the last mile of the original construction of the 41,000 miles, that is now 47,000 nearly. That began in Boston, oh, excuse me, ended in Boston. That, that, that expansion of the original system is what we're experiencing now. So we went from 41,000 miles to, to 47,000. I drove around America recently advocating, I became a, an advocate for investing in critical infrastructure, for investing in critical systems that are everything. Government is what we do together, infrastructure is what we build together, and the interstate system is probably the prime example of democracy in the form of concrete, asphalt, steel, and all those wonderful things you'll see in the exhibit. The 49 Hudson, though, uh, it's got a lot of magic. Uh, and this is the car shot with drones at the Folsom Dam in Sacramento, California, n near Sacramento. And the car is, is so rusty, so beautiful, but so rusty. I mean, should a car have patina? <laughs> my, mine does. <laughs> and uh, my point was, America's infrastructure is like this car. It's as old, rusty, and energy defunct as my 1949 Hudson. I couldn't believe the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers let us use drones right by their dam. 
So that's where I, that's where I am now. I'm, a, I'm an advocate for infrastructure and still writing about the subject matter. But to peel back the layers, it was a, a journey not about our broken infrastructure, it was the celebration of what we did so successfully that really drew me towards the Eisenhower interstate system, the big dig, and the civil engineering projects. I, I worked at the White House, I had the privilege of, of working on transportation and policy, and that's how I became interested in it on a level that was federal. And then I w dove into a project very deeply on the big dig in Boston. This is the National Geographic Channel shooting the car for a piece that we did. But I said, you know, when I, when I honk my horn, my lights dim. This, <laughs> this is America's infrastructure. And it's how far technology has moved with automobiles. When I accelerate up a hill, my windshield wipers stop if it's raining. My gas gauge reads full when it's empty. And no lie, my clock lost five minutes every day. And that's kind of like, if you think about the cost of old systems and a drag on, a, on, on commerce, you can make the argument that we lose a lot more than that every day. Eisenhower, uh, I know we're in Missouri. He really was born in Texas, so no one wins here, but he, he called Abilene his home. And Eisenhower, I find it remarkable that one person, one man in this case, can be responsible for so much, so much good. Uh, Eisenhower launched the U.S. interstate system. We'll talk more about that. The, the, the interstate system is named after him. We're talking about the red, white, and blue shields. Eisenhower believed that through building this system, we would save lives. He knew the carnage was especially high on these windy, dangerous roads. Route 66 was called Bloody 66 because of so many head-ons. You are twice as safe to be on the interstate system than you would be on almost any other road in the United States. The interstate system is a divided highway. It's designed for safety. It's also designed for commerce, to accelerate and speed up the flow of commerce and trading. It's a supply chain. And it's called the Dwight D. Eisenhower National System of Interstate and Defense Highways. You can define yourself almost anywhere. You don't need Google Maps. If, if you're at 75 and 30, you, 35 and 70, you're in, you're in Kansas. It, it, almost every crossroad is marked. The, the interstate system is numeric. The interstate system wants to be banal. It wants to be predictable. It wants to be uniform. People complain about it being boring, but it's the, the boringness of it, the standardization, that is its genius. It's a safe road because it is so predictable. Eisenhower was a man about technology. Eisenhower believed in the tank early on, and that is him with his buddy in trouble, Patton. And they, they were called back by the brass because they got out ahead of the army on the use of this piece of technology. And they were pre-World War I West Point graduates. So Eisenhower, Aviation, first, man to, first president to go down on a nuclear submarine. He just knew that technology was liberating and technology gave back to, to the populace. In 1919, he was so angry he didn't go to World War I and fight in Europe. He was in Gettysburg teaching men how to fire from a truck. Trucks were technology, high technology back in the day. But in 1919, a lot of these men had never been on a truck. They'd never fired a weapon. They'd never fired a weapon on a truck. He got a naval cannon, mounted it on a truck, and went through the battlefield of Gettysburg, training these troops, so good at what he was doing. The U.S. Army said, just stay there. He missed the war. He was so angry, so angry that he missed the Great War, thought his career was over. And then the U.S. Army decided to celebrate the victory through technology, and they wanted to show off all the gear, equipment that won the war, because it was our trucks that got the troops out of the trenches and were able to flank the enemy. And the, the, that trench warfare was locked down until Pershing showed up with trucks, and he kept saying, send me trucks, send me trucks, send me trucks. So in 1919, the war's over, back of the White House, they leave in 1919 in July, and they'd go out to San Francisco and they parade across the United States in a promotional bid 
to support the Lincoln Highway's construction. The Lincoln Highway was the first transcontinental highway, but it was mostly in people's minds and on paper, but it really wasn't out there yet. <laughs> it was just a trace across the land, but the U.S. Army said, we're going we're gonna to show off, and they led the convoy with these motorcycles, Indian motorcycles and Harley-Davidson's. And they sent these men out ahead to find the Lincoln Highway. <laughs> And they had big arrows they would nail to a fence post. It's here. It's over there. It's, and they found their way across the country. It took them a month just to get halfway. It took, took uh, it was a, a long journey from July until September. After two months, they, they finally landed up in the back of San, in San Francisco at the other milestone marker. This is Eisenhower's handwriting. He was a lieutenant colonel, 19... 19, he was 28 years old, and he was an observation officer for the tank corps. And he went along to look at and watch this, but really he said it was for a lark. I, he, he was so disgruntled, this convoy buoyed his spirits, kept him in the game. He wrote a chapter about it in his book, At Ease, Stories I Tell to Friends, called Through Darkest America with Tank and Truck. And Wyoming, in their brilliance, laid out lumber because they knew the Army was going to destroy their bridges, and they laid out lumber for them to rebuild their bridges. So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers rebuilt their bridges for them as they improved them, as they drove through them. Uh, they destroyed 80 bridges in their journey across the United States. And there is Eisenhower, right in the middle. Isn't this something? I mean, right in the middle. You can almost see like he's a born leader. And he had the time of his life on this convoy. But now he's the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. And he witnesses what the Autobahn means for the enemy. And he moves so much firepower, tanks, equipment, armory, that Khrushchev, when he came to the United States to visit Eisenhower, was one of the first questions he asked him. How did you do it? How did you manipulate dirt roads in Belgium and in France and, and move so much firepower? And then when, I, when Eisenhower got on the Autobahn, you can imagine what he was experiencing. In his mind, he said, we need wider ribbons across the land. The old convoy got me thinking, but the Autobahn made me realize we needed wider ribbons across the land. I'm paraphrasing, but it's pretty close to what he was saying. But the interstate system, I mean, the story is, it began here in 1956. We built half of it during the interstate decade. We built half the interstate system between 1956 and 1966. But we did the easy miles, if you can call moving so much earth the easy miles. <laughs> Going into the downtowns was another story. 12% of the total road net that is now 47,000 miles is urban. That 12% drove 50% of the budget. So Eisenhower, you can guess, being a fiscal conservative, said, I didn't know we were going to the downtowns. What, what are we doing going into the downtowns of America? He was imagining what he saw in Germany called ring roads. We would go around the cities. But he had other things on his mind like nuclear holocaust. He can be forgiven for not knowing the details. And really this was a move by Congress to get mayors on board with these projects and to get money flowing into the downtowns that were losing populations. So it was a project for... for other political reasons that Ike wasn't agreeing with, but we went into the downtowns, as the story goes. But what came of the interstate system? This is an engineering technology library. I, I want to just hit very briefly in our very short time together on the fact that the heavy equipment industry was born because of the interstate system's construction. A high-speed rail will create a whole new industry yet again, but the Interstate system was the largest project in the history of the world. It launched, and most of the equipment from road builders was farm equipment. There, there wasn't the kind of hydraulic diesel power that, that, they, that they needed to build these roads, so they invented them. Taking sometimes new technology, often existing technology, and supersizing it. Shipping, supply chains. Eisenhower was a master of it. He knew it more than anybody that the benefits of the interstate system would fold into commerce. What was good for industry, what was good for the economy, was good for the military too. The man created the industrial military complex for World War II. 
He warned us against it after he left the White House in 1961. But supply chains was, was his master stroke. And that's why he became who he became. He, he was about, about the administration of, of military movements. So the cargo containers, the, the trucking industry, the shipping industry, all this ripple effect around the efficient flow of goods along the transport of, of materials through trucking. And then the automobile. I mean, the Hudson, I, I, the, the 1949 Hudson is a, it's a beautiful piece of equipment. In its day, it was the Tesla. This is the Tesla. But in its day, it was a highly desirable, probably one of the most advanced pieces of equipment. It had a cage around the, the compartment for the passengers to keep them safe. It doubled up on the braking system, had redundancy in braking. It had all sorts of magnificence. And one NASCAR repeatedly in 1950, 51, Win on Sunday, sell on Monday was the, the, the moniker for, the, for Detroit. And I, I think what we're seeing is an advancement here. As the roads got better, the cars got better. As the cars got more desirable and people wanted to go even faster, there was more demand by the, pol by the politicians to create roads for their constituents so they could go faster. The Pennsylvania Turnpike opened up in 1940. And, I mean, high-speed neophytes, pretty frightening thought, right? We're driving from everywhere, West Virginia, Tennessee, all around Pennsylvania, to get to, the, to get to this 167 mile strip of the granddaddy of turnpikes, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Went from somewhere to nowhere. It didn't quite reach <laughs> Philadelphia. It didn't quite make it to Pittsburgh. But it, it, was a, it was a road without a speed limit. And people were driving at 60, 80 miles an hour in third gear, because that's all they had. <laughs> so technology improved. The cars got better. The roads got better. It's a fascinating yin and yang. Well, Merrill Eisenhower, Merrill Eisenhower Atwater, are you in the room? I had dinner with him last night. We were talking until just about two hours before I came here. He was still on the fence. Uh, he has a very young little boy that he's keep, uh, keeps, him, keeps him very busy. But Merrill and I went across the United States in 2006 to celebrate Eisenhower's 1919 convoy. We call it the, the reverse convoy. Are you sensing a road trip? Because <laughs> we had a blast, Merrill and myself. And uh, Merrill is now the director of aviation for Kansas. Uh, we are going to write a book together about the 1919 convoy. And we want to announce that together to you tonight. But we're very excited about that. So maybe in a year or 10, when we finish it, we'll come back. <laughs> but it was strange to drive across the United States holding a steering wheel this big, driving an old car, leading this convoy. It was a campaign to celebrate the interstate system. And Colin Powell gave a speech at the end in Washington, D.C., because we left out of San Francisco, went to Washington. We did have the time of our lives. And I came back high on the interstate system, and this happened. Anyone recognize this? It's, it's the Big Dig ceiling in Boston. I had just written a celebratory book about this. It went number one on the bestseller list in Boston. We loved this project. This was engineering being pushed forward like the like the space program pushed, pushed rocket science forward. This project pushed civil engineering forward. And I thought, how could this happen? How could 40 tons of concrete and steel fall for no reason? The earth did not move. There was not a truck that hit it. It just collapsed. And it was because of glue. 3,000 page NTSB report says, don't use glue when you're hanging ceiling panels. <laughs> I'm sorry, this project is fascinating, right? And I love it, and I think to myself, how could this happen? And there's a long explanation, but the short of it is, and tragically, someone lost their life because of that decision. And it, start, it started me thinking about the responsibility to talk about not just the celebratory side of the interstate system, but the other side of it, the, the need maybe. And I was a, you know, I was a spokesperson for the, the Big Dig. I was conditioned and trained to just think positively. <laughs> and I started thinking negatively. I started thinking, I think with some balance finally, in my manic highway ways, I started to tone it down and start looking at this maybe with a little bit more mature eyes. But I-35W happened a year later. So in July of 2006, the Big Dig ceiling tiles collapsed. And in August 1st of 2007, the I-35W bridge collapsed. Now, we were with someone today that is here in the room who was about, we figure, a few seconds from going across that bridge. Where are you? We talked. Come on. 
Angela was in this room this evening. We were talking, and she was just about to cross the bridge when it collapsed. Is that fate? Melina Del Valle was one second from leaving the tunnel, and she would have been alive, but she was a second behind. Civil engineering, it's civic, it's public. There's a huge responsibility behind it. And when this bridge collapsed, it started making me think, this is our road king. This is our primary source of, of commerce, of supply chain. The interstate system is less than 2% of our total road system, which is 4 million miles. The interstate system at 47,000 miles is less than 2% and it handles 25% of all of our traffic. It is the king of transportation on the surface and we let this happen to it. And I, I, I can confidently say this was easily avoided. But then again, looking backward is always easy, isn't it, to judge. Well, I thought then, that's when I want to go out and talk about the, the state of our infrastructure. I was on the History Channel with Michael Bloomberg and uh, talking about investing in our infrastructure, talking about investing in America, talking about what we need to rebuild our systems, what we need to do to invest properly so we have a better system, a better quality of life. Because interstate systems, all infrastructure really, they're the columns that support society. They are the columns that support institutions like this, universities and hospitals. Uh, there's a direct relationship between infrastructure and health. And I was talking with three doctors the, the, this, this evening. I kept thinking, everything they're talking about, it's about, it's, 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 there's nothing more important to all of us, right, than our, our well-being. And it's safer on the interstate system because of its design. I believe in America today, we have a lot of room for building systems that allow us a healthier life, like maybe bicycling, maybe walking, simple things like this. Who is this man? His name is Dr. Per Christensen. He saved my butt. I bought a car on eBay to promote my book, The Roads That Built America, in 2006, and thankfully he picked up the phone when I called in distress from a, a book that the owner, previous owner of my car had left in there with all the members of the Hudson Club of America, and he had a little wrench by his name, and he lived in Boston, and that meant he would help me. So I said, oh my God, I bought a car on eBay like a fool. I bought this car and I thought I could drive it across America. And in six weeks time, we got the car going. And I said, how am I going to repay you? And he said, take me with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no fool. <laughs> so I bought him a ticket and we drove. Uh, we, we were like uh, the male versions of Thelma and Louise going across America. <laughs> and, and, we stopped at every McDonald's between here and San Francisco and back. We did 14,000 miles together in that original Hudson. He, uh, my life took a turn, and he saved me uh, again uh, by, by being willing to go out and buy a 1949 Hudson, not the 51 that I originally needed his help with, but the 49. Because I had this, this crazy idea. I said, we can make this look like America's broken infrastructure. And when we bought it out of a barn in upstate New York, we didn't change anything. We wouldn't even wash it. We wanted it to look rusty. But the problem was it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> we, we bought the car. Uh, he had been driving Hudson's his whole life. This is him in 1966 with a 1949 Hudson, right? This was his dream car. But I had a turn of fortune with family and finance, and I found myself in a really dark spot and Pear was the, the bright light, and the road trip was the, the savior. Uh, he telegraphed, though, to the owners that we were going to buy this car. Uh, he walked right up to the car, opens the, hinge, the door, squeaking. He takes out an oil can from his pocket and begins to oil the hinges. <laughs> I'm like, Pear, you're telling them that we're going to buy this thing. You know? But that's a true story. The man is one of the most remarkable individuals uh, you'll ever meet. And this is the family we bought the car from. This is a bit of America, but Mrs. Martin is the name of the car because Mrs. Martin was the original owner, the only owner. And she was so angry at her husband for driving the car around Stanford, New York, an uptown chicken farm town up in New York with dirt roads, that she put it into a barn in 1956. The car wasn't that old, 1949 Hudson, and forbid anybody, including Mr. Martin, especially probably him, from driving it again. It had 31,000 miles on it, but the engine was not in good shape. So we buy it, we roll it into Paris garage, great, a great, laboratory. Great, great. This man, 
Is that planning? He put tires behind the back. I didn't know that. I'm saying, pair, brake, brakes. Well, there's no brakes. And he knew before we left, two days before, that that's where we would land up. That is Pear's laboratory. That is Pear's garage. He is a genius when it comes to these machines and these engines. I wish he were here to talk to you about the technology. But in our long, long trips, he taught me so much about the advancement of automobile technologies, about the advancement of the, the science of, of propelling oneself with diesel engines and, and, and gas-fired engines. His favorite tools, the, 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 the wrench, the vice grip wrench. He uses it for everything. It's amazing. So we worked on this car for almost two years. And we finally got it going. <laughs> I, I'm just like trying to keep up with him. I'm just trying to like, uh, you know, make sure that we don't put the wrong tools in the wrong bucket. Coffee cups, by the way. See them all in the back there? Those are all McDonald's coffee cups. No lie. You can't make this up. Five engine blocks later, five engine blocks later, we got the original parts of the car, but he had a lot of resources. Uh, the, this, is, this is his brain trust here uh, of an, our supply chain for, for parts and pieces. And when we finally had our spare car in the trunk, we left Boston <laughs> and went across the United States. And that trip took us 20,000 miles around the United States in two years, in 2013 and 14. And then I did it again with Engineering News Record a magazine uh, about civil engineering construction in, in 2015. And then I got married. <laughs> it's the end of the road trips, right? But we, were, we picked up Worst in Show. <laughs> we, we did. We got that reward at the, at the car show. This is our checklist before we leave. This is a 1949 Hudson. Had not been out of the barn. We had not driven more than 150 miles before we launched on our 20,000 mile journey. That's called making it up as you go. And we, we did, and I think everyone can understand why I did this. The, the man who married me, I had him do this before I left on my trip. He's a Franciscan monk in Manhattan. <laughs> right? Wouldn't you do the same? Find your God and get that thing blessed because it needed all the help it could get and it, it got a lot. So here I am with an engineering news record. Luke here did the drone shooting. Eileen is the senior editor for transportation uh, and Bart and A there lined up a lot of our, our media along the way. First stop, West Point. The first civil engineers to work on roads. The first highway engineers came out of West Point, built the National Road. Arguably the first engineers trained in the, in the true discipline of engineering, civil engineering, came from West Point. And if you're familiar with the logo of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, this is one argument for where it came from. And they even have a sense of humor, right? <laughs> they reserved a spot for us, an electrical car uh, for Mrs. Martin. Her reputation preceded her. And we went across the country and met fascinating people everywhere we went. In Pennsylvania, this man arranged a meeting with the Secretary of Transportation. We talked to the Chamber of Commerce. He owns a very large construction company. He was shipping a 259-foot-long concrete reinforced beam across a rail yard. Why was he in a rail yard? He said, because all the bridges in Pennsylvania are suspect, because all the weight limits have been lowered, or most of them had been. And he couldn't get out of his yard going over a normal road or normal bridge. He had to apply for permits. He got them. The state police was there. He was going through the rail yard with all sorts of permission, lights flashing, and this still happened. How can broken bridges lead to a train derailment? It's all connected, all these different categories of infrastructure. You think about it, the grid, aviation, roads, bridges, rail, heavy rail, light rail, dams, levees, right on down the line, wastewater, all of them are affected by each other. And that's what made me start thinking holistically about infrastructure and about the technology behind it. So we also hit Detroit. Pear had to see the Packard plant. We went in it. There it was in its glory. It's pretty famous and infamous all at once. Pear's a Packard man and a Hudson man. In Indiana, we went 300 feet below the earth to look at 26 miles of tunnels being built. Not for subways, 
but for water, storm water. Indianapolis, the White River, almost all these great cities are on rivers, right? I'm not talking about the Brush Creek here, I'm talking about <laughs> major rivers. But we went down there and explored, because when ha what happens in Indianapolis, which also happens in a lot of these Midwestern cities, like Cincinnati and Chicago, when water hits at a heavy rate, and there's a flood event, a storm event, it only takes about an inch, not even that, of water on the streets to overflow the system. So the sewage systems carrying rain and water runoff get overcapacitated. They unleash gates, and those gates allow the, the sewage. We're talking feces and urine, gas and oil, all mixed together out into the drinking water source, Lake Michigan or Lake Erie or wherever they're getting their water from. And that is a, a, a treacherous cycle, and these tanks, these big tunnels, will hold water until the filtration plants can catch up. It was fascinating going down there, though, to see these tunnels being built below the, uh, below the corn fields or soybean fields. And then Pear was up above doing repairs on our wet clutch. We, we have a wet clutch with cork technology. We've advanced quite a bit since 1949. We went back to the I-35W bridge collapse. Through failure, so much remarkability is achieved through engineering. And now they have a beautiful bridge, a most beautiful bridge, built with $250 million in an accelerated program, and they did it within 12 months. Out in North Dakota, we saw the old homesteads and the new homesteads, <laughs> a man camp for fracking. And it was uh, appalling, really, to see the conditions people were living in. But this is like a mining town. These are wildcatters. Uh, to see the ex exploration for, for energy was, was, was part of the mission. And then we, we, we turned the car into a movie studio. We, made, we started doing interviews with these construction engineering, civil engineering luminaries, talking about solutions, talking about how can we resolve some of these problems we have. Up into the Rocky Mountains, and I love this about the interstate system. I love this about the Eisenhower interstate system. The highest point of the interstate system is underground. <laughs> At 11,000 feet, 11,000 feet, you're uh, underneath the Continental Divide, you're going through the Rocky Mountains, and you're taking I-70 into western Colorado. And it was going to stop. It was going to dead end, and uh, I-70 was going to dead end into Denver until the congressional committee found out about that, and they went to Washington and did what good congressmen, senators, and, and governors do. They lobbied hard and got I-70's little line to be carried over now into Kansas, into Colorado, uh, excuse me, and beyond into Utah. Where does that I-70 end? Salt Lake City, I think? We did a brake check. <laughs> Back in the day, technology, advancement, they were so worried uh, in, the, in Detroit that neophytes with cars would take substitute brake fluid, maybe something, anything, to put into the master cylinder. So they hid it. And they hid it under the floorboards. <laughs> and so that's what we had to do every time we checked the, the master cylinder. But you want those before you go through the Eisenhower Tunnel, 11,000 feet, because the trip downhill through Glenwood Canyon is remarkable. This is that challenge, that little line that someone drew saying, okay, we'll extend I-70, meant going through Glenway Canyon, meant going past Route 6, the old road, with I-70, the new road. And it is arguably one of the most remarkable scenic drives in the world. But because of environmentalists, because of people wanting to preserve the canyon walls, said you must tread lightly, even with an interstate system, you have to tread lightly through here. And that forced a remarkable achievement. And I, I think that's always the case. And the big dig it was, you will not build that tunnel system unless you can keep the elevated highway you're going to replace running. That was Michael Dukakis, who hates cars like people hate evil. <laughs> but he said, I'll, go, I'll sign on this bill here for the highway project, but you must keep the city running. Those simple political civic gestures require remarkable engineering. Anyone recognize this thing? It's the largest milling machine in the world, 57 feet. Where did it get stuck? Seattle. Seattle. Stuck in Seattle. It sounds like a movie, doesn't it? <laughs> I, 
this is serendipity. I was on a tour. I'm a friendly side of the journalism world to engineering construction. They let me come to see the project. We get there, and the thing gets stuck. And there's veins popping out the guy's head. You picked the worst day to come here. But he let us in. And we went into this machine. It felt like we were in outer space, not underground. 450 feet long, this, this machine. Can you see there? We went through the entire machine to the head where it had stuck, gotten jammed up. And look, these men had gone to, China, to Japan, to Hitachi, where they had made the machine. I think it was Hitachi, Hyundai. Hitachi, I think, made this giant machine. And there it is on the computer screen. Zero. I mean, that's an expensive endeavor. And they had to rescue it. They had to dig down to it and then replace the shield. It, down the Oregon coast, got pulled over by the... Uh, <laughs> Come on, I saw it at a general store. I thought, that's i got to stop and uh, do a picture out of time there. Arrived into San Francisco on this quixotic circumnavigation of America that felt very much like John Steinbeck and Travels with Charlie. And a friend of mine came up with this idea, depressed about his girlfriend leaving him. Uh, he was thinking and brooding, and he's like, what if we just lit up the whole Bay Bridge, the whole west span of the Bay Bridge with LED lights? No lie. The Bay Lights. Two million dollars of money from all the Silicon Valley wealth, and it was a great, very successful art exhibition. Four miles of lights across those two super spans, those end-to-end -end suspension bridges, which when it was built had never been done before. An anchor right in the middle here with more concrete in it than the Empire State Building holding two suspension bridges end-to-end, -end, an artificial anchor for the ends of those two spans. And the mayor, he was the head of the Department of Public Works. He had heard about my tour and unexpectedly invited me into the chambers in San Francisco to talk with him about the mission, about rebuilding. He said, my Katrina is going to be an earthquake, and I want to be prepared. And there's so much seismic development in that new Bay Bridge, it's, it's a remarkable story in itself. And they just built their first tunnel in 50 years in California on the Pacific Coast Highway by Devil's Slide. Tunnels are remarkable. There's 55,000 bridges on the interstate system more than one every mile, either one you pass over or under. But there's 55,000 of them. There's only 100 tunnels. Down the Pacific Coast Highway, past New Orleans, the levees, we all know the story there, but the Army Corps of Engineers has finished a $15 billion endeavor, and that project has reinforced the city of New Orleans, and now you're seeing investment flow again. Because the city is now safer for people, business, you're starting to see a healthier economy, a healthier community. And Pear, it got me thinking about this tag on his license plate. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, I, I heard so much when I was reading and researching my books about the horseless carriage. But it, that's what it was. Uh, it was, uh, the horse was removed, the small engine was placed in, and off went this buggy without a horse. It was the strangest thing to see. Sounds like a driverless car to me. <laughs> and I think that's the mentality we're at right now. Are we ready for this? And I read just yesterday a tragedy about someone on I-435 went through a construction site and over a railing and down an embankment and died. And in the same spread, other page on the corner, was a story about driverless technology. And I think how much safer we actually will be. Uh, this is not maybe, this is already happening. Insurance companies are already making adjustments uh, about how fewer accidents there will be, how much the premiums are going to drop, body shops are going to be uh, a lot less prevalent because the cars are going to be safer and they're going to get us there faster and we will need fewer of them. Imagine a future where 80 percent of the cars go away because we're, we're using them. We, we use our own private vehicles, some people have estimated 5 percent of the time of its life, it's running. 95 percent it's garaged or parked. But if these, all these cars are moving about and we're sharing them all, there'll be a lot less cars, there's a lot more space suddenly. What are we going to do with that infrastructure? What are, what are we going to do with that space? It's a land bank. It's a great opportunity. 
And one of the things I hope for, one of the things I, I'm very dreamy-eyed about is high-speed travel on trains. Oh, has anyone been to China lately? I've spent a lot of time in China. What was it like? Where did you go? Um, Shanghai, Wuxi, Harbin. How did you get around? Uh, flu and train. Remarkable, isn't it? Uh, Beijing to Shanghai. I took that train. It was a 19-hour trip in 2004 and 2006. And then in 2010, it was four hours and 35 minutes. And they were slowing their trains down because they were doing damage to their tracks by racing them. So not the, I'm not hearing Excel talk about that. I'm not hearing Amtrak saying, we're going to slow our trains down because we're, we're ripping up the tracks. No, it's just the opposite. We, we, we are struggling in this country. Europe has done it since 1981. Japan started this whole craze in 1960. And China has built the largest high-speed rail system in the world. And that meant they also built a secondary system of transportation called subways in second-tier cities and first-tier cities. And it's this ripple effect. There's this magnificent movement of people on fast trains to better subways, to bicycles, to driverless, well, not driverless cars yet, but at least shared cars. And you can start to see where things are changing very quickly. I think we're going to see some exciting endeavors, maybe Kansas City to St. Louis, maybe, maybe Austin, Texas to, to where would you go? San Antonio? You could go to Houston. You could go to Dallas, Fort Worth. And in, in, in Boston, uh, we're very hopeful of a fast train to Washington, D.C. Uh, it takes four hours on a bus. It takes four hours on Excella. Three hours and a half, they say, but I've been on Excella many, many times, and it's four hours to Manhattan. You can take the Fungwa bus for 15 bucks, or you can buy a ticket for 180 on Amtrak. We've got to figure out this other mode of transportation. Well, I'm going to end it right there, not on a down note, but on a very exciting up note, because as one NPR reporter I was talking with in conjunction with this event today said, we're like cockroaches, people. We will always survive. We'll always figure out the solutions. We will go on. I'm like, you're the strangest optimist I've ever met. <laughs> but I agree with her. We are going to go on. And she had her PhD in philosophy and her minor in medieval art. So I think she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. And, and it's been very fun to be here. If you have questions, raise your hand. I'll come by with the microphone. We're videotaping and live streaming, so we want to get the audio uh, on the camera. So uh, let me start here, and I'll come over. Do you mind telling us the age of your uh, companion on your road trip? Dr. Per Christensen, he's an educator. He was the first man in the Peace Corps, one of the very first in 1960. I think he was in the Philippines. Uh, he's 80 years old, 81. And he, he moves engine blocks around. He, I call it old car yoga. He does a head dive into the, into the engine compartment. He's a remarkable man. I learned so much more about life, though, you know, imagine all those hours uh, than I did about engines. And I learned a lot about engines from, from him. Uh, Patience is what he taught me, really. <laughs> uh, you were so lucky to uh, have your dream um, vacation or, or a, a journey, uh, which coincided, of course, with your scientific endeavor. But I'm just asking, with all of this wonderful, you're talking about the past uh, stream, uh, the fast stream uh, train and the cars and all, what about the infrastructure of our roads and our bridges? You talked about the 50,000 uh, bridges that go across and all that. All that has to be worked on before we can improve everything else. V very interesting point. Uh, did everyone hear that question about with, with all this technology, shouldn't we be focused on potholes and fixing bridges that are rusty. And I couldn't agree more that the, the maintenance is where we, we were so neglectful, we're, we're, we're remiss. Uh, I, I, I shudder at the term deferred maintenance. <laughs> it makes it sound scientific. Uh, we don't have any money, we don't want to spend any money, we're not going to do it. That's what deferred maintenance is, and we see it over and over again in the country, and we see it in all levels of infrastructure. The American Society of Civil Engineers has said, we give you, America, a D plus on all your infrastructure, the weighted grade. Uh, and that's everything, the grid, 
That, that is airports, that, that, is, that includes also roads, bridges, all the, all the categories, schools and parks included. Uh, yes, we, we need both. You, you can't do one or the other. Uh, you have to have both. It'd be like having a house with running water but no electricity. If you didn't think towards the future but take care of your, your inventory. And I think it's a very, very important matter. I feel like we're, we're starting to look like Europe. We're starting to see the value of, of maintaining our structures. Not everything is a, a disposable item like our bridges were in the past. And our growth is leveling out. But I think it's this movement of the younger generations that are saying, you know, I don't want to live in the exurb. I don't want to be way out. I want to be close to where I work. I want to be near transit. Uh, I, I'm seeing, a, I predict a great boom uh, in, in, in transit and public transportation. You asked about the terminal points of I-70. <laughs> Did Eastern you go to the terminus, <laughs> The Eastern Terminus is a park and ride near the Social Security Administration complex just inside the Baltimore Beltway. The Western Terminus is an interchange with I-15 in Cove Fort, Utah. Well, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's amazing. These roads go across the United States. The, the longest road is I-90, the biggest superhighway in America. I was fact-checked by the New York Times for an article I wrote for them at least three times. You know, 3,019 miles. Are you sure? <laughs> so I appreciate that. But they both, both terminuses are so unceremonious. They just kind of end into like a ramp and, and it's in Seattle it's just a it's an off ramp to another interstate inter interchange interstate highway how are these self-driving cars going to be fueled well there's a lecture coming to the <laughs> Linda Hall library about these self-driving cars they're going to be electric they're going to be diesel they're going to it's it's not the uh, power train and the power plant it's it's the the brains that are really going to be driving these cars uh, I think you're going to see probably electrical vehicles though I want to hear about the story about the Tesla. Uh, there was two stories. One very negative, uh, an operator of a Tesla was killed when his car swerved in front of a truck or a truck swerved in front of them, whichever. And then the next story a few weeks later was a man having a heart attack or felt like he was having one, instructed his car to drive him to an emergency room. <laughs> you know, there's good, there's positives and negatives, but I'll go any day with the driverless car technology that will get me there safely, as opposed to the person in the, I won't say minivans, because that's not fair, but <laughs> SUV, you know, any car with a video going on their phone, texting, bubble gum in the steering wheel, you know, there's so many distractions in a vehicle, and we have coffee cup holders to prove it. I, I think driverless technology would be a welcome thing for most of us and much more efficient. You can travel much closer together if these vehicles are talking to themselves. So I have a question about, um, you know, the old saying that if you'd ask people what, uh, you know, 100 years ago, what, what they wanted for transportation, they would have said faster horses. But really, they just <laughs> didn't know to ask for a car. So there is such a wonderful romanticism about the highways. I mean, you can take the, you know, the I-70 across the United States, or you can go down 66 and be reminiscent and things like that. So like, when it comes to the future of transportation in this country, it's probably going to be something in that analogy of like, not quite faster horses, it's going to be something different. So it's nice to preserve the highways that we have, but I'm curious about what we might do other than that in terms of infrastructure to get places around the country. Well, you must have an idea. <laughs> well, you know what, it was it actually the, the thing that prompted the thought was that um, you said the, in Detroit it was win on Sunday, sell on Monday, and then you NASCAR. showed... NASCAR. NASCAR, okay. And the Tesla, that's Elon Musk, and his next thing is the Hyperloop. Yes. Like, that's the crazy fast train to, uh, across, it's up the west coast, right? That's the 20 point. minutes from San Francisco to LA, who could argue? Uh, you, you might not survive the trip because it's going so fast, it's 700 <laughs> miles an hour, your insides might turn out, but the idea is underground, low energy, move, and I, I'm, so, I'm in the world of the subterranean. Uh, the Big Dig is an underground project. Uh, I just think the future is really below ground. I think the future is in tunneling. 
uh, because these land rights are so dangerous to get involved with. Uh, you've got mineral rights and water rights and then the land rights in California. You've got all sorts of obstacles. Uh, people are lawyering up quickly. But below the earth, there's fewer objections. And that's what Elon, Elon Musk is suggesting. And who cares if you can't see the scenery? If you're just there in 20 minutes, who cares, right? <laughs> yeah, you just watch a video or go to sleep or whatever. It's very interesting, though. I like that, uh, that analogy of a faster horse. Bicycles were certain that they were going to start taking over the world uh, in 1890. I was just curious uh, about uh, China. I know there's no ADA there, and I, I just, international travel, I haven't really done anything, and I'm just curious what your feel for that is just from being in China. That's, that's a very good point. Uh, the, in, in China, uh, they're at the beginning stages of, of going through, I think, all the steps and the procedures that we went through back in maybe in the 50s, where we had more handicap ramps, more accessibility. And I've traveled so much there and been so discouraged myself just moving about. I've often thought about that, because when you go up to some of these platforms, it's just nothing but stairs uh, up and down. But you see it at the airports, where they are trying to meet a, an international level. And I think because they want to so much be a part of this international scene, we saw that with the 2008 Beijing Games, where they built an airport terminal that was larger than Heathrow Airport in Beijing to take on all these new people coming into the country, but also afterwards to keep feeding the economy. Uh, I, I'm excited. I'm very bullish on China. Uh, I, I spend about a year, about a month every year for 10 years there, and I saw radical changes in 10 years in their infrastructure. But the remarkability of the, of the movements uh, of once you're, once you're in your seat, to be able to take a single seat train to Beijing from Shanghai, you, you, it's, it's effortless. You go from downtown to downtown. Uh, that's what we're hoping for in San Francisco and LA. That's what we're hoping for in all these big cities that would be connected by high-speed rail. We went through our troubles, uh, and it's so easy to cast uh, criticism on, on a country that's up and coming, that's trying to achieve. But the, the investment in infrastructure, not the Chinese government, not anybody promoting China, the World Bank said, you know, Deng Xiaoping raised the quality of life so much that he got a, about a half a billion people, with a B, above the poverty line because of his decision to invest, to create a market economy, a capital economy. And they started building roads. And that was the, the model. I've talked to many officials in China, and they said, we took the best of the interstate system and the best of the Autobahn. We looked at the Autostrad, and now we have our interprovincial system. And it's remarkable. You feel like you're on US highways when you're in China traveling. They also have the heaviest axle tons. They have 300 tons per axle on their trucks, which is forbidden here. We have 80,000 pound trucks. Dan, that was a wonderful lecture. Thank, Thank you. you, Eric. Thank you, Thank you all. <laughs> wow. <laughs>Two important points to make before uh, the final thank you for attending. Uh, number one is we have Dan, Dan's books in our collection. So uh, just come back uh, and check them out, literally and figuratively. How, how um, cool is that? Galileo and me. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have your first editions. I, right? No, you don't. I'm going oh, okay. sure, to give them to you. If Galileo could have a first edition here. And uh, the second point is the self-driving car lecture is Nove Thursday, November 3rd. Martin Searhouse, uh, who is director of Nissan's new research laboratory in Silicon Valley, uh, will speak that evening. And his team is developing a driverless car for Nissan. And he says they will have a product on the street in five years. So I hope you can... Uh, return for that program. It should be a, an interesting talk. So thank you uh, again, Dan. Thank you all. And, and thank you for attending tonight's program.